Hello, welcome to another section of our Unit 3 notes. Today we're going to talk about compromises at the convention. So we're going to kind of break down some of the major issues and compromises that the delegates in Philadelphia had to reach to be able to come up with the Constitution. All right, so first of all, let's talk about what a compromise is. That's really important to kind of understanding our process today. So a compromise is a settlement of differences in which each side makes concessions or essentially gives in a little bit to come up with the result which solves a problem. So the important thing is the end result is that it solves a problem, but not everybody's going to get exactly what they want. You're going to have to give in a little bit to be able to get some kind of resolution at the end. And so I think we'll see that as we go through the notes today and talk about some of the compromises they made at the Constitutional Convention. So we're going to talk about three major compromises today. One is called the Great Compromise, one is called the Three-Fifths Compromise, and one is simply a compromise on trade. So first of all, we have to talk about the battle that takes place over how to set up the legislative branch of government. So, of course, the legislative branch is what we would refer to today as Congress. Um, but the big discussion in Philadelphia was how do we determine how many people come from each of the states? Um, this is a really tricky question because states are not necessarily created equal, um, or if you look at some of the smaller states' viewpoints, they are equal because they're all states. So there's a big debate on how we should base representation in Congress. Should it be the bigger states have more people in Congress, or should it be that everybody has exactly the same amount of people? So it becomes a battle essentially between the states with smaller population and the states with larger populations. And they start both coming up with plans on what Congress should look like as far as how we determine representation. Several states begin to submit plans for the type of legislature they want, and essentially we start to kind of boil down to two specific plans. So the first one is called the Virginia Plan. So this is the one that is favored by the states that have larger populations. So in this plan, the legislative branch would have two houses, so it would be like two sections of the legislative branch, and both houses would be assigned representatives based on wealth and population of the state. So states like Virginia, for example, would have a lot more people in the legislature than a smaller state such as Connecticut. The New Jersey plan is the plan that is supported by the smaller states. And this is a, a similar looking plan. The legislature would have one house, though, instead of two. The major difference is each state would have one vote in the legislature. So it doesn't matter if you have a ton of people like Virginia, if you have a smaller population like New Jersey, every state's going to get one vote. So if this looks familiar, this is essentially what they did in the Articles of Confederation. When they decided to vote on things, every state had exactly one vote. Dun, da, da, da. Enter the Great Compromise. Now, this is also sometimes called the Connecticut Compromise because um, it's kind of brought forth uh, from people from Connecticut. But this is what the Great Compromise comes up with. All right, so it takes the part of the Virginia plan that says that there's two houses of the uh, legislature. Um, I have a graphic there of two houses, but obviously that's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about two groups of people. Um, when you think back at what the British were doing, they had two houses in their legislature. But this is really a brilliant part of the plan. So take the legislature, break it into two parts, and then you're going to have different representation in each of those houses. So one of the houses of the legislature is going to be called the Senate. And in the Senate, every state has exactly the same number of representatives. So it doesn't matter what your population is you have two senators, whether you're Virginia with a lot of people or you're a, a smaller state in population like New Jersey, you also have two senators, all right? So this is going to be very much like the New Jersey plan where everything is equal, all right? So that's one of the houses. The second house is going to be the House of Representatives. This one is based on population. So to give you kind of a rough idea of kind of where we're at today with the House of Representatives, um, the smallest state in the United States as far as population is Wyoming. Wyoming has a little over half, um, half a million people. They get one representative in the House of Representatives. When you look at the population of a, a large state like California, California 
has almost 40 million people. They have 55 representatives in the House of Representatives. So this one is based completely on population. Now we're going to talk a little bit later in the next unit about things like how a bill becomes a law. The beauty of this particular compromise is that when you pass a law, it, in most cases, has to go through both houses. So it has to go through the house that's um, advantage to the uh, very um, high population states. And it also has to go through the other house, the Senate, which is essentially equal for each one and gives more power to the small populous states. So when we talk about Congress or you hear about Congress on the news, Congress is like our entire legislative branch, but it is made up then of two houses. One is the Senate, and we have 50 states. Every state has two uh, people in the Senate, two senators. So there's 100 senators, and then there's 435 members of the House of Representatives. And then those are distributed according to population. And we'll talk a little bit more about this process in the next unit when we talk about um, things like elections and stuff like that. Now, the next major issue that they're going to tackle at the Constitutional Convention is the issue of slavery. Now, it's not going to be the issue of should slavery be allowed or not allowed in the United States. Um, there's a lot of discussion that if that was even kind of brought up, the southern states would probably not um, form the United States of America. So they don't tackle should there or should there not be um, slaves in the United States. What they decide upon is should they be po should they be counted for population or not. So the solution, even though it's not a very good solution, is called the three fifths compromise. I say not a very good solution in my opinion. So the issue is should slaves be counted as population for taxation, and should slaves be counted for a state to determine the number of representatives in the legislature. So the more people you have in your state, the more representation you have in the legislative branch. But you also then have to decide whether or not those slaves should be counted for taxation purposes. So the northern states, the states that really don't have a slave population essentially, they want slaves to not be counted to determine representatives, but that they should be counted for taxation. On the other hand, you have the slave states that want slaves to be counted for uh, determining representatives, but not for taxes. So you have these opposite viewpoints on how slaves should be counted in a state's population. So what they come up with is called the three-fifths compromise because they decide uh, representation based off of the slave population counting as three-fifths of a person for population. Um, this is used for taxation and also to set up the number of reps in Congress. So when they take the slave population of a state, they only count three-fifths of those slaves as population. So they kind of meet in the middle a little bit. They're counted, but not counted entirely. Now, of course, this should be brought up that, you know, the whole idea of counting somebody as three-fifths of a person for something like population um, just shows kind of the uh, the cruel nature of slavery and um, the devaluing of humans as slaves um, in this particular system. Now, the last issue is going to be the issue of trade. And this happens to be kind of mixed in a little bit with um, the issue of slavery. Um, what they decide to do, because they're battling back and forth about how they should set up trade, whether or not they should allow slave trade, things like that. The northern states agree to do nothing about slave trade until at least 1808. So the northern states promise that they're not going to try and eliminate, for example, slave trade. Um, you know, people coming in from other countries that are then sold as slaves. The southern states agree to allow the national government to regulate trade. So think back to the Articles of Confederation. That was a huge mess. Um, there was no national regulatory um, commission for trade. States were doing all kinds of things on their own with other countries. So this is how they resolved that trade issue, by kind of a, a trade-off on not doing anything about trying to ban slave trade or regulate it. And then the southern states agree to have the national government regulate trade throughout all of the states. So in all three of these compromises, no state's going to get everything they want. 
But in the end, they do come up with a constitution that they think will be an improvement over the articles. And for the most part, um, they're correct. I mean, it, it's not perfect, um, but it's definitely something they can work with. And it also is something that has been duplicated by many, many countries around the world. So that is our section of notes on compromises at the convention. If you have any questions, let me know, and we'll try and maybe explain it a different way or, or maybe look at some examples of how these compromises came about. Thanks.